Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start at the very least on my review of Meridian by Alice Walker. Uh, so as always, I'm going to read you the blurb, then I'm going to check out my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, Dane reads... A new British edition from the Women's Press. Meridian Hill, a high school dropout with a child and an absent husband, begins to understand something of her black heritage when she volunteers to return to the Deep South to help civil rights workers in a voter registration drive. As the 60s take their bloody toll on black leaders, Meridian leaves her child and goes on to college where she fails to become a lady but learns a good deal about betrayal, love and hate. In the years that follow, revolutionary talk becomes unfashionable. The American dream of individual success reasserts his power over Meridian's lover, Truman, and many of her friends. But she herself continues to dream of and work for a society in which the oppressed have the strength to seize full control of their lives. By the author of The Colour Purple and her blue body everything we know, Earthling Poems 1965-1990 to complete. So yes. Meridian, let's get started. So we learn that uh, the town they're in has a, a tank. It says, the town of Chikaima did indeed own a tank. It had been bought during the 60s when the townspeople who were white felt under attack from outside agitators, those members of the black community who thought equal rights for all should extend to blacks. They had painted it white, decked it with ribbons, red, white, and of course blue, and parked it in the public square. Beside it was a statue of a confederate soldier facing north whose right leg, while the tank was being parked, was permanently crushed. And so Meridian's getting letters from her mother, it says, uh, they contained Bible verses and was written by Meridian's mother, the gist of which was that Meridian had failed to honour not just her parents, but anyone. Sound very supportive, don't they? It's because uh, she had a child out of wedlock. And a great little quote here. They have a saying for people who fall down as I do. If a person is hit hard enough, even if she stands, she falls. And Anne Marion says, yes, I will kill for the revolution without a stammer. Yeah, Meridian knew her tenderness, a vegetarian because she loved the eyes of cows. I'm a vegan because I love all animals. And Meridian's thinking, um, when she was transformed in church, it was always by the purity of the singer's souls, which you could actually hear. The purity that lifted their songs like a flight of doves above her music drunken head. If they committed murder, and to her even revolutionary murder was murder, what would the music be like? Someone says, I know violence is as American as cherry pie. Which I suppose it is. So um, I like this, we get the start of a chapter here. Medgar Evers, John F. Kennedy, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, Robert Kennedy, Che Guevara, Patrice Lamumba, George Jackson, Cynthia Wesley, Addie Mae Collins, Denise McNair, Carol Robertson, Viola Luizzo. It was a decade marked by death, violent and inevitable. Funerals became engraved on the brain, intensifying the ephemeral nature of life. For many in the South, it was a decade reminiscent of earlier times, when oak trees sighed over their burdens in the wind, Spanish moss draggled bloody to the ground, amen corners creaked with grief, and the thrill of being able once again to endure unendurable loss produced so profound an ecstasy in mourners that they strutted without noticing their feet along the thin backs of benches, their piercing shouts of anguish and joy never interrupted by an inglorious fall. They shared rituals for the dead to be remembered. But now television became the repository of memory and each onlooker grieved alone. And somebody tells a story to a young boy, boy called Saxon who has a heart defect and it scares him so much that he dies of a heart attack. And because of that, her tongue is clipped out of the root. Choking on blood, she saw her tongue ground under the heel of Master Saxon. Mutely, she pleaded for it because she knew the curse of her native land. Without one's tongue in one's mouth or in a special spot of one's own choosing, the singer in one's soul was lost forever to grunt and snort through eternity like a pig. And I want to read this uh, scary story that she told. Many, many years ago on the banks of the Lalokak River in deepest Africa, there lived a man blacker than the night whose occupation was catching little white children, those who had lost at least one tooth to the snags of time, and planting them in his garden. He buried everything except their heads. These he left above ground because he liked to hear them wail and scream and call for their mothers who, of course, did not know where they were and never came. He fed them honey and live eels still wriggling that, that slipped through their lips and down their throats, while underneath their ears the eels' tails still struggled and slid. At night the children's heads were used as warming posts for the man's pet snakes, all of them healthy and fat and cold as ice, and loving to flick a keen quick tail into a snuffling defenceless nose. The man used to laugh as he... And then it cuts off. And we talk about Meridian's mother They could, and her father. They could talk together and were friends long before she felt a toleration for his personal habits that she identified as love. We get a reference to somebody thinking that uh, pregnancy is a communicable disease that you catch through germs in the air. And uh, we get a reference to Daxter's, a restaurant owned by George Daxter, an obese half-white man in his 50s. Uh, when Daxter was born, he was thrown out into the street with the rest of the trash. Who, he was raised by an old woman who later died of tomain poisoning. She'd eaten some sour, rotten tomatoes Daxter gave her. I didn't know that was a thing. <laughs> and we get uh, Meridian. She'd heard that fat men had short, stunted penises. She imagined Daxter's penis to look like an English walnut. Uh, Meridian uh, goes and 
wants to volunteer and she gets asked, uh, can you type? Which I just thought was an interesting, again, sign of the times. Obviously we wouldn't ask that now because we just assume everybody can. And Mrs. Hill tells Meridian, uh, it never bothered me to sit in the back of the bus. You get just as good a view and you don't have all those nasty white asses passing you. And I love the line, uh, the last time God had a baby, he skipped too. Very true. And Truman speaks some French. And we get, Truman loved all the foreign cultures of the world, but his favorite was French. He had spent a year in Avignon, in Paris. He believed profoundly that anything said in French sounded better. And he also believed that people who spoke French were better than people, les peurs, les miserables, who did not. And I like this, the start of a chapter called The Recurring Dream. She dreamed she was a character in a novel and that her existence presented an insoluble problem, one that would be solved only by her death at the end. She dreamed she was a character in a novel and that her existence presented an insoluble problem, one that would be solved only by her death at the end. She dreamed she was a character in a novel and that her existence presented an insoluble problem, one that would be solved only by her death at the end. Even when she gave up reading novels that encouraged such a solution, and nearly all of them did, the dream did not cease. I just thought that was quite cool and quite meta. We get a reference to someone who beats his wife and children with more pleasure than he beats his mules. And Anne Marion uh, doesn't want to be friends with uh, Meridian anymore, so she says, Meridian, I cannot afford to love you. Like the idea of suffering itself, you are obsolete. Which is kind of funny, but very sad as well. And we get this, you're 34 now, aren't you, darling? Would you believe he's heading for middle age? Jesus Christ, I'm 33, I'm 34 in a couple of months. We have rape mentioned, uh, Lynn gets raped. Um, She'd obviously not been, in his opinion, raped. All his life he'd heard it was not possible to rape a woman without killing her. To him, in fact, rape meant that you fucked a corpse. And so because she, like, didn't fight off the rapist, uh, they assume she was a willing participant. Uh, the children loved to play in the pool when the weather was hot and would sneak behind their houses to wade in it. The public white swimming pool, having been ordered by the federal government open to blacks, was closed by city officials who were all rich and white and who had, moreover, their own private swimming pools in their own backyards. There had never been a public swimming pool for blacks, few of whom consequently knew how to swim. And then right on the last page, it sour, left a sour taste in my mouth because it used the word lingeringly and I hate unnecessary uh, adverbs. But yes, Meridian by Alice Walker. It's got some really interesting stuff about race. Uh, I wrote in my written review, uh, it's one of the, it's probably the most powerful book that I've read in terms of transporting me back to the 1960s in America. Uh, looks at the civil rights movement, it's got like class divisions in it, and just a really interesting snapshot of history that's also a warning for the future and a reflection on our, our modern time as well, I think. So uh, I don't know when it was first published actually, let's have a look. 1982. Uh, which tracks and it's still kind of as relevant today as you can probably tell I really enjoyed Meridian I gave it a strong four out of five and would recommend So there we have it. That's what I made of Meridian by Alice Walker as always Don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book if you read it hit that like button If you've enjoyed this video hit that subscribe button for more and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye